Hey everyone, what's up? Goldie here, and I'm gonna hopefully quickly try and keep this a little bit short today. Be going over the um, eight game main slate we have on uh, Monday, August 21. Uh, some shenanigans we got going on in the mound here. Not a lot of guys. I mean, we're missing three officially announced starters. Um, some confusion across the industry. DK has got freaking Blake Snell going for some reason. Uh, this isn't necessarily a source of the confusion uh, from MLB's perspective because they have officially announced Waka at the moment. So um, down here in Kansas City, we've got either Tucker Davidson. He's also officially announced so far. Um, you know, from MLB, but DraftKings has Alec Marsh going, right? Um, Johnny Cueto on the other side of the San Diego game. I have him here in the sheet. Some confusion. There is no announced starter here for them yet. Um, it, it was reported last night that it was going to be Ryan Weathers, who just came over at the trade deadline from San Diego, um, but he is no longer the official starter, so we have no idea what's really going to happen there. Should be okay so far for Texas, Arizona. Um, same thing in, with Cincy and the Angels, Boston and Houston, um, Seattle and the White Sox as well. David Peterson is going to be going for the Mets. It looks like it's going to be Alan Winans for Atlanta. Uh, by most accounts, it is going to be him. He just hasn't been called up just yet. He'll be making, I believe, his third start. Um, we got a major league debut here for Drew Rom in St. Louis. He came over from Baltimore in the Jack Flaherty trade. So he'll be uh, up and debuting for the Cardinals tonight. And then we've also got, you know, here's kind of our third spot here with Pittsburgh. I've got Bailey Falter in here. It uh, looks like he, by most accounts, is going to be the long reliever. But uh, who the hell knows? So um, a lot of stuff that we can kind of hopefully briefly uh, get through really only a couple of you know excellent arms that kind of stand out uh, that are in pl very playable spots number one being Luis Castillo of course he gets the White Sox that's fine uh, seeing you know 25 30 percent ownership that it's kind of expected here. I generally don't like paying 10000 for him, but we'll get to that. Um, then you get Giolito getting the Reds. This might make just uh, cringe a little bit. It's kind of high ownership here in, in what's a difficult spot. I like the price tag, but yikes. Uh, and then we just kind of look for a f secondary filler. Um, naturally, down here at the bottom, Paul Blackburn in a very good spot against Kansas City and Oakland tonight. Um Seeing a lot of ownership, and he really probably should. We'll get to that. Christian Javier, though, getting Boston, also seeing some ownership there. Yeah, not so sure about that. So let's just get into the games, and like I said, hopefully we can keep this to um, you know relatively condensed. I'll try not and yap so much here today. So for Drew Rom going for the Cardinals, um, he is a soft toss and lefty. Don't have any data on him, obviously, at least here in the sheet. Soft toss and lefty spent most of the last year plus in AAA. Um, but did have some appearances in double A when he got moved up, I believe, at the end of last season in the Baltimore organization. So soft tossing lefty, about 90, you know, low 90s, 90, 93, somewhere around there. He is a four seamer slider with a bit of a sweeper um, or a slider with some sweep, I should say, for the most part. Um, and that will really keep him down in the strike zone. Um, you know, the, at least the slider sort of aspect of that pitch and then when it sweeps a little bit that'll give him a little bit more of a fly ball lean. we talked about this several times with a four seamer slider it generally gives you about a neutral to a fly ball lean um so the pirates on the other side could you know from a um just a like either side platoon sort of perspective be able to lift the baseball here a little bit um off speed pitch i haven't been able to find anything um you know i probably would have seen something if it were a splitter. So it's likely just a, a change up. He could be um, bringing in a cutter as well. So uh, I'll leave you guys to do uh, a little bit more research on that. He's 4,000 and he's a left-hander. He is stretched out as a starter. Um, so that could put him in play if you need to get all the way down here. And maybe he pops for 15, 18 points or something like that. Could see a little bit of win equity as the Cardinals do get Bailey Falter over here. Um, and that could give him a little bit more value, certainly at 4,000. I don't think this is bad, but a soft tossing lefty, I generally like to stay away from, uh, certainly when they're making the, their debut. Um, 
you know, these two arms in terms of, you know, just raw velocity here, Bailey Falter and, and Drew Rom are going to be very similar, and I'm certainly not playing Bailey Falter. So um, I don't like soft tossing lefties. There's a lot of right-handers just naturally, you know, lineups are um, typically more right-handed heavy. And the Pirates can platoon quite aggressively here, right? They did just get G1 Bay back. Uh, they might lead him off, or I mean, earlier in the season they were had him down at the bottom, but um, you know, over the weekend they were leading him off against lefties a little bit. Brian Reynolds, sure from both sides, he's 4900. Probably not my favorite there, but I do like Kutch, Brian Hayes, Connor Joe, and some Henry Davis. Endy behind the plate uh, is fine. He's struggling in his first go here, uh, but for all intents and purposes, getting a triple-A arm. Um, so I like the Pirates here getting plus money on them, about, uh, plus a dime in the betting markets right now. And I don't think this is a horrible play because this guy's making his debut and he's only throwing 90-92. So uh, I think it's fine to go after him. Um, but if you do see that he's got an elite changeup or something, that almost certainly would have come come up in my cursory research. But, uh, you know, if I miss something, which is absolutely possible, it wouldn't be the first time then perhaps you could even consider mixing in some Drew Rum or coming off the Pirates, uh, or both, right? Um, Bailey Falter at 63. Now, I, I do think the price tag, naturally, on an eight-game slate is going to put him in play, but not in this matchup. I don't like going after St. Louis um, you know, with soft-tossing left-handers. And although Bailey Falter does have five pitches, we talked about this, I believe, in his last appearance, you know, for the most part, uh, it's at a pretty unimpressive five pitches, right? And no value here on uh, really any of them in the 240 hitter, 230 hitter sample that we've seen on him this season. Now, caveat, uh, I'm still dealing with the fan graph shenanigans. Now, my, um, my platoon splits down here are updated and correct. It's just the aggregate numbers that I'm having a little bit of a problem with still. But for the most part, over larger samples, we can take some good you know, glean a good bit of info out of these numbers, no matter. So 66% uh, strike one's good, 5% walk rate's good, 9% barrel rate's good. So with a five-pitch mix, generally that will keep him in play, but not for me in this particular matchup. I think his upside is probably limited to 16, 18 points, somewhere around there, and that might even include some win equity. Um, I think it's just more likely that the Cardinals here Against left-handers, these numbers are updated for sure. Um, yeah, they are still creating, still making a lot of hard contact, still hitting for a little bit of average, pushing 260 here with a 166 ISO. Not a ton of power there. The ballpark's going to suppress power a little bit, certainly. Right-handed power uh, over here in PNC. Um, so that could get you off of some of the Cardinals if you'd like, and maybe you could, in deeper tournament stuff, land on a Bailey Falter. Um, I'm going to leave them off, though. I don't trust any of the upside. I think it's pretty significantly capped, and there's other guys in this range I think have far higher upside uh, at a higher probability, too. So that's how I'm going to approach um, this game, just offense, I think. Okay, let's move on. Mets and Atlanta. We're going to see a mostly similar approach here for me. No David Peterson against Atlanta. He gives up too much power. Um, now he does have some strikeout stuff and some good ground ball contact, and that could very well keep him in play a little bit uh, from a survivability standpoint against Atlanta. Um, you know, not fully updated numbers. I believe the last day I had fully updated numbers could have been David Peterson's last start, you know, five days ago. In any case, five and a half ERA with uh, expected pointing a little bit lower and, you know, a, a low-ish strand right here, 73% with some whiffs and a lot of ground balls. So we could potentially see some positive suppression regression uh, emerge here for David Peterson. This is certainly not the matchup I want to go after that and chase that, though, because he's still only throwing about 57.5% strike one with an 11% walk rate. He just puts too many people on base for free. Um, you know, if this were coming via contact, you know, his base runners, this buck 65 whip here, if it were mostly because of base runners... Um, and, you know, there's to a large degree, it really kind of is here, giving up a nearly 300 average. Um, then I could get more convinced that the regression is more likely to set in sooner. And you could potentially, at a nice price tag, go after uh, a really good offense on a shorter slate 
um, and look for just an outlier performance. I'm going to leave it off, though, I, because I don't trust a, um, a respectable sample here, 53 innings and a 12.5% walk rate against right-handers. I do like the ground ball stuff, of course, and I do like some of the swing and miss, uh, but he just can't throw it over the plate. He's just got trouble throwing strikes, and this is a uh, that's a really poor recipe. Going after Atlanta, you're going to walk a guy, walk two guys. Acuna is going to steal bases. Um, and then you're going to get Austin Riley, Matt Olson, even from the left side here. Dave Peterson gives up a lot of production to lefties. Um, perhaps an Eddie Rosario, if they recognize this platoon split for David Peterson and throw him in the lineup. Um, Michael Harris is going to be in there, likely still in the two hole. You know, so batted ball-wise, from a ground ball to fly ball standpoint, not the best matchup uh, for the Braves necessarily, but still so, quite a bit of attackability here because David Peterson is just going to put too many people on base for free and give up a lot of contact, right? Um, so I think you know, with such a high whip here, you can just go after it with the Braves. They're a very viable stack. Uh, price agnostic, they're almost definitely the best stack of the day. Um but, of course, you got to pay 68 for Acuna, 65 for Matt Olson, and 61 for Austin Riley. Michael Harris is 48 now. Ozuna's up to 45. Sean Mur Murphy is still 54. You know, so these guys are not cheap. And we kind of still just have to take the same approach with Atlanta that we've had to take the last three months nearly. It's just pick one or two of the more expensive guys, mix in three of the cheaper guys if you're running full five stacks. Um, but... Oftentimes, it's just short stacks because when they're not hitting the baseball over the wall, it's hard for Atlanta to get there in in full teams for you. So uh, that's kind of how I'm going to approach the Braves here today. You know, get your token exposure to them and just get after it. Um, Alan Winans, maybe a little bit of exposure for him here. It's 7,500 simply because there's not many other guys in this price range that you're – that I'm all that comfortable playing. Uh, some are going to see some ownership, Blackburn and some Javier, of course. Um, you know, David Peterson on the other side in the 7K range, not going to see any. So that could put Alan Winans in here, uh, into your pools from a construction standpoint. But I've got questions about strike one. We can't really take anything out of, um, you know, no values or any of this short sample noise for Winans. You just had the two starts, right, and only seen 50 hitters, less than 50 hitters. Um, but it's the strike one, right, that that is going to converge the fastest here. Can't even really take a lot, you know, maybe a little bit out of the swinging strike rate. But everything else, uh, raw strikeout rate is noisy, raw walk rate even still noisy at this sample size. So distribution of the uh, of the arsenal is probably our next, um, you know, point of earliest convergence, so to speak. So it's really your, your swinging strike rate, your your cult or strike one rather swinging strike rate and your arsenal distribution here. That's really all you got to go by. And I think that's going to have to put some of the bets here in play. Um, four seamer, two seamer, of course, against right handers is not going to be a good pitch. So that puts Pete Alonzo and even a Frankie Alvarez in territory or um, into play rather. And uh, Frankie Lindor from the left side of the plate, you can get to him as well because he's still going to see a four seamer, you got to be careful because in the early going with the slider change, inducing some swing and miss. So I think that's going to put him in play because the Mets are overall still a pretty poor offense. Not many guys you're all that excited about playing on a, you know, really any slate, to be honest. Nimmo at 46, price adjusted, I think is fine. Lindor at 51 is okay. I really don't like playing Jeff McNeil. I uh, wish they'd, you know, move him out of the top of the lineup. He just didn't have any power. Um really any upside. Maybe he'll swipe a, swipe a bag every now and then, but it's not all that regular. So it's Pete Alonzo and like Frankie Alvarez from an over-the-wall upside uh, standpoint, along with Frankie Lindor. So not my favorite getting to Met Stacks once again. You know, you can find some, sure, because down at the bottom of the lineup, they're cheap and very playable. Danny Vogelbach, yeah, didn't strike out a lot. DJ Stewart, fine. Johnny Arauz, dual eligibility, 2,400 in the infield. Okay, fine. But for the most part, Mets are still very unimpressive. So I think that this can still put Allen Winans in play. And if you need 18 points, likely to get some run support here from Atlanta, uh, or from his offense, that is. So, you know, you could get some win equity 
out of him, and I think at 75, that might put him in play. I got no problems here with 10% of your teams and some Allen Winans um, going after the Mets a little bit, but I do like a couple of short Met stacks. They're going to be kind of off the board because they're the Mets, and they're terrible. Okay, let's move on. I'm starting to yap here a little bit. Seattle and the White Sox. Castillo, 10-3. I don't like the price, but relative to everybody else on the day, he's probably underpriced, to be honest. And that means at 25% ownership, he's still got some of the highest upside, pretty much irrespective of the matchup. And he does get a pretty good matchup here against the White Sox, right? 23 average K rate here for them against right-handers this season. Sub-150 ISO. It's pretty poor. 235 batting average. A lot of ground balls and an 84 WRC plus with just a 31% hard contact. All of those numbers are below average. And they get an above average arm here on the other side who's got well above average strikeout stuff to righties in particular. They, they might have five lefties in here tonight, as a matter of fact, uh, with the absence of uh, Tim Anderson. He'll likely still be out on his suspension. Um, so they, those lefties could make it a little bit difficult on Castillo. He still has a high barrel rate and is still a, a really bad changeup. This is how we've attacked him when we do attack him all season, but he's still striking out 28% of lefties and not giving up really any batting average. Um, you know, about a 230 XBA here. Does have a 190 X ISO, so he'll give up some pop and some fly balls mostly to the left side. I only want a fly ball hitter if I'm going to play anybody from the right side, and that's, you know, Luis Robert ter territory. At 5,200, he's fine, right, because he's obviously got the most upside. Everybody else I mostly just want to stay off of outside of a potential Andrew Benintendi at 3,300. I think it's okay here. He'll hit some ground balls, and this lines up bad at ball-wise pretty well for him. Same thing with a Gavin Sheets. Um, he's going to try and lift it, though, so I'm not super thrilled about that necessarily. He's going to strike out a lot. Um, the other guys from the left side, Yohan Moncada, Grandal, and an Oscar Colos, for example, not super um, intimidated by any of these guys. I've got no problem playing Luis Castillo here today at 10-3 uh, at and, and mixing in some healthy ownership. Um, you know, wouldn't be surprised if he gets tagged for a couple runs. He, he does this sometimes and just kind of comes out and, and shits the bed. Uh, two of his last three starts have really not been good. He got beat up for seven earned against the Angels, and then gave up four earned against the Royals in his last outing. And in between that, however, in kind of a difficult matchup, he tore apart Baltimore, went six innings, struck out eight, gave up just one run. So he there's, there's variance here with uh, Luis Castillo. I want to jump on board here, I think, in this particular matchup. They're still missing Tim Anderson, who doesn't strike out a lot. Um, you know, and no matter who you throw in there, they're still overall, historically, a worse hitter than Tim Anderson. So I've got no problem with Castillo. Tuki Dusan, I'm just not doing this. Uh, I'd, I'd much rather just play Winans. 7,500 at the exact same price tag. 51% strike, one, 17% walk rate. Those two numbers take it out, of, take him out of play for me entirely. Um, now, that said, he doesn't get barreled, right? Just a 7% barrel rate here, and still has a respectable 28% CSW, despite a sub-10% swinging strike rate. He's not giving up any batting average allowed here. Shorter sample, but um, still very encouraging from that perspective for Tukey. It's just the control. He cannot throw strikes. 7,500, I'd rather just try and take shots on Winans over here rather than uh, Tukey against a bad offense in Seattle. It could put him in play because Seattle is bad, and it's a playable price tag, but you know, don't be surprised if he walks five guys and, and makes it you know, three and two thirds here, um, just because he elevates the pitch count. He, he cannot throw it over the plate. Has trouble early. Has trouble late. It's just that he doesn't give up a lot of contact and induces a lot of ground balls. So he should be stranding a lot of runners here. We do see that materialize with a 75% strand rate, but he just gives up way too many base runners. Um, so I think that's going to play into Seattle's strength here a little bit. Now price tags, they're starting to see some some increases here. Should we get, get Excuse me. It should be getting J.P. Crawford back tonight. I believe he's eligible to get activated today. Um, Julio's been fantastic recently, but he's up to 5,900 again, so that's kind of stiff. Gino's still at 42. That's playable. Cal Raleigh at 45. Playable. Ty France, probably not so much here at 37. Not my favorite. Same with Tay Oscar. Not my favorite, but at a playable 4,000. You want to mix in a Marlowe or a Canzone in the outfield. Also playable. Staying off of Josh Rojas here. He hits too many ground balls. So... 
you could find some Seattle stacks definitely because this walk rate puts literally everybody in play from a full stack perspective. Uh, everybody it, by means of an opposing offense. You could play every offense in baseball against this type of walk rate. So that's fine. Um, and I'm going to leave Tukey off. I just I hate high pitch counts in, in the early innings, and I hate walks. I cannot stand them. Um, there's nothing more frustrating from a starting pitcher. Just throw it over the plate, man. you got a defense for a reason. So I'm going to leave him off, but um, yeah, there are some underlying metrics here that could suggest that he could be in play in deep tournament stuff. I don't think you could get to this in 20 max. At least I can't. I can't stomach that kind of risk. Okay, let's move on um, to Boston and Houston. James Paxton, I, I like the price tag, of course. I like the strikeouts against the right side because Houston's going to have a hell of a lot of right-handers in the lineup. Maybe Kyle Tucker's going to be back. I believe it's uh, you know, back or something. Um, I forget what. In any case, it's still Kyle Tucker. He doesn't strike out a lot. He's Kyle Tucker. He's a good hitter. And you got to get through Jordan Alvarez, too, from the left side, who doesn't strike out, and he's Jordan Alvarez, right? All the other right-handers, though, don't strike out at all. Houston, against left-handers this season, has an 18% aggregate strikeout rate. That is two ticks better than anybody else on the slate split adjusted. Um, it's just an incredibly bad spot for Paxton here. 120 WRC+, plus, 190 aggregate ISO here against left-handers this season. There's, there's upside for Houston. That makes them a very viable stack, stack even though Paxton is good. He's going to struggle with right-handers in terms of power allowed still, and when he's giving it up to right-handers, I love playing righties in Houston, as we've talked about several times this season. So if you can make price tags out, I'm not jacked about 6,400 Jose Altuve. Let's not get that confused at second base. But Alex Bredman is okay and playable here at 5,500. Um, Yiner Diaz I like at 38. Not wild about the price necessarily, but the numbers are really good against lefties. Same thing with Chaz McCormick, 45. I think that's a playable price tag. And even Jeremy Pena against lefties this season, it's okay at 4,200 if you want to mix him in at shortstop. Not my favorite price-adjusted stack, but fundamentally there's significant upside here uh, in this ballpark and in this spot against Paxton because he's still giving up 37% hard contact with a 42% fly ball rate, right, against right-handers, 22% line drive. So he's very much tackable here with a 200 ISO nearly uh, to the right side. On the other side, Christian Javier, 7,100. I am not going to come in at 25% ownership, I'll tell you that much. I hate the strikeout stuff against the left side, and Boston is going to have five lefties in here that don't strike out hardly at all. It, well, it, four lefties at least, right? Alex Verdugo, Rafi Devers, Masataki Yoshida. Now, Tristan Casas... Um, he might be back tonight. He came out with a tooth infection or was scratched. So he's been out the last couple of days. Um, not my favorite there if he's got a, an aching jaw or anything like that. 4300 though, playable price tag. Simply due to the contact he's going to be able to make against Javier here. I think that's fine. What normally keeps Javier in play against the left-handers, it's not the strikeout. It's not the power that he gives up, certainly, or the batting average. It's just the hard contact and the number of fly balls. 060 ground ball to fly ball with soft contact means that he induces a lot of pop-ups and that gets him out of a lot of trouble. However, against the right side, 40% hard contact, 033 ground balls per fly ball. This is not a short sample, right? He is a heavy, heavy fly ball pitcher here with the four-seamer slider. And he gives up a lot of power, 175 ISO, ton of fly balls. It's not so much in batting average, so from the right side, you're kind of homer hunting. From the left side, you are not homer hunting, and you're, um, you're looking for some batting average and some base runners. So that makes for a really viable stack, as a matter of fact, with Boston here, and they're not going to be popular. Really, nobody in this game will be from a, an offensive standpoint because there's two respectable arms going. But I like stacks here, and I'm not going to be playing uh, pretty much any Paxton Maybe in a deep tournament shot or two, but nowhere close to 10%. And nowhere close to 25% Javier for me. So give me Boston. They're my favorite. Um, you know, from a contact perspective, it's, it's got to be Houston. But from a, a raw upside perspective, I like Boston here a good bit. Okay, let's move on. Cincinnati and the Angels. Another really popular arm here in G. Lito on the other side. We'll get to that in a sec. Graham Ashcraft, not popular at all. Uh, I think he could be in play here in the you know mid-8K range. It's kind of a dead range because there's nobody else really that you want to play they're either more expensive or way cheaper 
So I think this has to put Graham Ashcraft in play at sub 5% ownership. Um, you know, that's just from a DFS perspective and a game theory perspective. From a fundamental perspective, we talked about him introducing the sinker and throwing this at a very heavy clip, 25, even 30% to right-handers over his last six or eight starts. So these, this distribution right here uh, between these three pitches, sinker, cutter, slider, it's not true um, to what it's been in the last you know, half a dozen starts or so. He's throwing this, the two-seamer a lot, and that's neutralizing a hell of a lot of the power that he was giving up previously when he had just the cutter and the slider. He was on the barrel. He had only the cutter coming into the season, and he was on the barrel because this is a horrible pitch to same-handed hitters. It tails over the middle of the plate, and it gets hit very hard. It's not a soft con, or it's not a um, same-handed hitter type of pitch. You go after opposite-handed hitters, and sure enough, with a really good cutter, you can induce a lot of soft and rollover type of contact, and that's what he does. Buck 80, ground ball to fly ball to the left side, 19% soft contact, 20% hard contact. Those are fantastic figures right there. We usually have upside concerns with Ashcraft because he doesn't throw it past anybody, right? Um, and the, the two-seamer cutter fastball mix is really not going to change that. He'll induce whatever swing and miss he does have to either side with the slider because that's his only secondary pitch. But it's not going to impress us there. So at 8,500, the raw strikeout stuff and swing and miss is totally priced out. We don't have that. But from a DFS theory perspective, I think it puts him in play because he's throwing the two-seamer a hell of a lot more to righties, and he's not going to get picked apart nearly as terribly as these aggregate numbers suggest. The hard contact number is going to come way, way down since he's throwing so much of the two-seamer to right-handers now, and the, and the ground ball rate is going to go way up. So, um, you know, the power rate is going to come down as well. I, th I think that has to put Graham Ashcraft in play here a little bit. We've been attacking the Angels for the last couple weeks now with right-handers, good right-handers, uh, and Ashcraft is still good. He's still got velocity, right? Mid-90s, upper-90s. And with three pitches now instead of two, it very much puts him in play. Um, I don't want to play any of the lefties from outside of Otani from the Angels over here. You want to take a punt on a Nolan Chanuel? He might be leading off again. But again, the hard and soft contact numbers here with such high ground balls, I don't want to deal with this from the left side. So no Moustakas, no Mickey Moniak. Uh, maybe from a contact perspective and a fly ball perspective for Moniak. So those would be the two guys, Otani and Moniak. Um, but I don't really want to deal with any of the right-handers here either, Drury, um, who they just got Logan O'Hoppy back from his busted shoulder or whatever it was earlier this season. Hunter Renfro, Randall Gritchick, you know, not all that impressive here. So I think this has to put Graham Ashcraft in play in tournaments. Giolito, 9,300, 37% ownership. I want to be very careful with this man. I do not trust the amount of power that he gives up. A full 200 uh, X ISO. Yeah, there's strikeouts at 25%. But a 200x ISO with a lot of fly balls from Geo, 085 in aggregate, neutral to the righties, but 050 to the lefties. A lot of power to both sides. A lot of homers. 4% raw home run rate is not nothing, and he's very attackable in that respect. So if you want to go after uh, Giolito here, I've got no problem playing some because he still has some upside to get through the Reds here. But they're overall against righties this season. Still a 95 WRC plus creation uh, type of offense with you know, average batting average. They'll strike out 24% clip, slightly above average ISO, and below average hard contact. So they're attackable, definitely. Um, but maybe getting a little bit carried away here with the ownership. I haven't built teams yet, so you may just like land on this type of number by default. Um, but he's very attackable, and that has to put the Reds in play in tournaments. And, but really, unfortunately, like TJ Friedel is 4,900. No, thank you. Steer is 5,000. You know, not really excited about that. Uh, E3 at 3,400. That's a playable price. 47 for Votto, playable price. I think price adjusted, it's Votto and Ellie De La Cruz for me. Or a Will Benson from the left side of the plate. I, I like this at 3,300 for him down at the bottom of the list. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they did just call up a Noel V. Marte. He's cheap at shortstop. Good hit tool. Um, good contact hit tool in middle infield as well. So I'd rather play, um, you know, if I have to get there, I can't get all the way up to Ellie De La Cruz, who lost dual eligibility again 
Um, you know, Noel V. Marte is a, a fine piece there if you want to run like a Benson Marte, Joey Votto weird stack or something. I mean, okay, you could find something here, but it's kind of goofy because everybody lost their multi eligibility here in the infield. McLean is sole second base now. Um, Ellie sole shortstop. So a little difficult to get to red stacks, but from a, a game theory perspective, leverage on Giolito is very much in play. Okay, let's get to Texas and Arizona. Um, Jordan Montgomery made me look like an idiot in his last outing. I'm still going to short him, and I'm still fading him. I, I don't want anything to do with this at, at 9800 He's not a $10,000 arm. Uh, I, I just don't trust these price tags, even though it's not out of the question that they can pop for a good outing. Um, at those price tags, probabilistically, they're they're too expensive. So uh, I'm not going to deal with this here, and I'm going to stack Arizona on the other side. Cattell Marte, it's okay at 5500 here. Um, Corbin Carroll, you could fade at 59 in this spot. I generally hate playing lefties against Jordan Montgomery. His numbers against the left side over his entire career are just elite. Doesn't give up any power, induces soft contact, gives up no hard, etc., etc. So you could fade Corbin Carroll here. Unless you're stacking a lot of Arizona, getting a good bit of exposure, um, you know, then you don't want to fade Corbin Carroll, of course. But, you know, in a single entry or three max team, you could you could come off um, really the highest upside guy on the team, but in the very clearly the, the worst batted ball matchup. Uh, Tommy Pham, I do want to play, though, seeing the baseball a lot better recently. Um, that series in, in uh, San Diego really got him going. Christian Walker, I want to play again, 5,400. Not super stoked about the price tag, but it's okay. Lourdes Gurriel at 44, that's fine. Kyle Lewis is still cheap as his buddy Kennedy or as our buddy Kennedy, Gabby Moreno, and Nick Ahmed down at the bottom of the lineup as filler pieces. All these guys are fine because Montgomery still gives up a 175 ISO, 35% hard contact, neutral for all intents and purposes, ground balls per fly ball to the right side. He's a little bit attackable there. Um, I'd like to get to game sacks if I can because uh, Slade Sacconi, I believe I called him Cade in the, the last uh, video we made. In any case, his name's Slade. He's going for Arizona, and I want to play Texas, so let's do it. If you can make game stacks happen here, I would really like to try and get to it. You don't have to if you can't make it work positionally um, or with the prices. But I like Texas as well. I think Marcus Semien here is fine um, at 57. I'm not super thrilled about the price, but it's okay in stacks, of course. Corey Seager, I'm going to play him every day. And Nate Lowe is okay at 45. Not a ton of value necessarily at his price tag, but fine in stacks. 56 for Addy Garcia, same de same deal with him. Mitch Garver, price adjusted, has got to be my favorite at 3,600. Really like this spot for him. Uh, Travis Jankowski, probably going to be in there again as well at 2,700. He's fine too, as is Zeke Duran, you know, or a Leody Tavares, uh, excuse me, Tavares down at the bottom of the lineup. All of these guys are fine. And you know, there's plenty of cheap pieces that you can make, you know, game stacks happen here if um, if that's a viable construction for you. So very little pitching um, here. 5,600 for Ciccone could put him in play, but not against Texas for me. I'm just not going to deal with it. Uh, I'd rather just go elsewhere. So no pitching here uh, for me, even though I do like Montgomery as an arm. He's just overpriced for me. Okay, Miami and San Diego. Like I mentioned at the outset, I've got Johnny Cueto in here, so we're just going to go over him right now. If it is Ryan Weathers, then I'm even I'm probably less likely to stack San Diego uh, because I respect Weathers to be a little bit more serviceable in the early innings than Johnny Cueto. Um, deep tournament stuff, Cueto could be in play because he he's got six pitches here and he does the goofy nonsense with his. I mean I know we've only got less than a a tick in the in the curveball, but it is a, it is a show me pitch. He does have it. Um, he does all the nonsense timing shenanigans with the wind up and everything. That sometimes can confuse a lot of uh, poor and, and below-average offenses you know, against right-handers. The Padres are certainly that, even though they've got some good hitters. They just don't create, man. They don't strike out a lot. They walk a lot, mostly coming from Soto. Um, but they only hit for a 230 batting average, right? Manny Machado really struggling against right-handers this year, hitting, what, 215, 220 or something like that. Power is still there, but really struggling with the batting average. Juan Soto really hasn't hit for a lot of average, nor has Tatis. Um, or Bogarts, for that matter. Hassan Kim's really been their best average, uh, batting average type of hitter all season. So eh, I'd, I'd be less likely to um, 
you know, really get a ton of exposure here with the Padres, but I do like going after Johnny Cueto. He just gives up way too much power, man. 212x ISO here with a 20% strikeout rate and a lot of fly balls, right? 34.5% hard contact, 065 ground ball to fly ball. Short sample this season, but these numbers have really persisted for him over the last couple of years um, since he's more of a an innings eater anymore. So if it's Cueto, I do want to stack the Padres. Um, price tag's not thrilled with, but I do really like Xander Bogarts, 4,600, and I'm okay with Manny Machado. Hit a couple of balls out over the weekend, maybe starting to come into form a little bit. Jake Cronenworth still at 42. think this is fine. And Tatis at 63. It's not excellent, but it's, it's fine still. Hassan Kim may be a little pricey, but he got his dual eligibility back, so that puts him back in play at 4,700. All fine there. If it's Ryan Weathers, like I said, I'd much rather um, come off of the Padres a little bit. Not that I want to play Weathers. He is, uh, let me check on the price tag for him. Um, actually, DraftKings removed him, so I don't have his price off the top of my head. They've actually got Blake Snell going over here. So, you know, who the hell knows what's going on. Um, uh, and actually, he's not even playing for San Diego anymore. I'm getting confused here. He, he is with Miami. He came over at the trade deadline. So, um, forget everything I just said for the last three minutes. Ryan Weathers, um, if it is him instead of Cueto against San Diego, now we're back on track, uh, I'd be less likely to stack the Padres because he's kind of hur herky-jerky in motion a little bit. He hides the baseball well, and he's still got a little bit of velo at 95. Problem with Weathers is that he's not really stretched out. Um, San Diego net never let him go more than an inning or or like three innings, maybe. He was just a, an opener type of guy. So what the Marlins might do over here is if they go with him, they might bring in a Cueto or something as a long reliever or just run a bullpen game. And that kind of makes it a little bit more difficult on a, an average offense over here for the Padres. So um, now that we're less confused on who's going to be going, uh, that's kind of how I want to approach it. No pitching for either of these guys outside of maybe a super deep tournament shot with DeQuato just because of the timing mechanism that he throws into the lineup uh, sometimes. It it really screws with you at the plate, um, especially a guy like uh, Manny Machado, right, with a leg kick and all that kind of garbage. Michael Walker, I've got him in here, but who knows if it's going to be Snell or, or whoever the hell else. Uh, 9800 I don't like the price tag. I think he's expensive here too, but I would rather play him than Jordan Montgomery. Um, I would rather – you know, not play either of these guys. I mean, if I got to choose to be quite honest, but um, I'm okay playing a little bit of Waka here. It's the changeup that keeps him, keeps him in play. He's going to be able to compete against uh, Luis Rise and Jazz Chisholm from the left side of the plate. Jesus Sanchez, not really worried about that with this good change. He does not give up power to the left side. That's the changeup going to work. Buck six, buck 15 ISO. To the lefties, 26% hard contact, 20% soft. Really attractive there. A lot of fly balls, but it's it's soft contact. It kind of bloop sort of, um, you know, line drives here at the 23%. So not all that threatening from a left-handed perspective. It's the righties that you mostly want to get after him with, but he doesn't give up any real production there either. Sub-200 batting average, 170 ISO, a little bit of power. So you could maybe homer hunt with like a Georgie Soler. Um, not my favorite, though. I would rather play like a Jake Berger uh, from a ground ball to fly ball perspective. Hits ground balls against the right side. His problem is, is strikeouts. So similar to the Tony Gonsolin play, um, you know, in the last time we talked about Miami and talked about Jake Berger, I think he had two balls out in that game. So um, I think this is a similar matchup here against Waka. He'd be my favorite price adjusted. But Michael Waka is a little bit better than Tony Gonsolin, and hopefully Michael Waka is not hurt. So not my favorite playing a good bit of the Marlins. However, you're catching nearly seven to five in the betting markets right now. Um, you know, buck six seventy or so in the in the markets. I don't think that's terrible. It might be a little bit of value on the Marlins um, going after Waka here. But in DFS, I think you know, this is a fine tournament play. Ninety eight hundred with him, and I've got no real issue there. Um, so that's kind of how I want to approach this. Maybe some Waka, some Padres if it's Cueto, less of the Padres if it's Weathers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, last game here. Let's get to it. Casey and Oakland, see if we can go quickly. Tucker Davidson, probably just going to open for them, I think. It might be Alec Marsh. That's who has. Uh, that's who DK has, rather. He might be like a long reliever. They've done that with him a little bit recently. Uh, but Tucker Davidson, don't believe, is uh, stretched out really at all. Just an opener, and he doesn't have a single start. Uh, on the season, so he's all of his appearances are out of the bullpen. Um, 
so we can't play him at this price tag, and I'm not really sure I want to be playing lefties against Oakland anymore now that they have Asteria Ruiz back, and they have Zach Geloff, who's been fantastic, uh, up at the top of the lineup. Still a guy, a lot of guys that don't strike out a ton. It makes him decent contact against the left side. You know, Brent Rooker, still plenty of power. Jordan Diaz, power as well, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't really want to stack Oakland here necessarily because they're probably going to get a bullpen game, whether it's Alec Marsh. I mean, he's a right-hander, for example. He'll give up some pop to the righties. Um, so you could find something as like a, a late three stack or something as a filler. Um, but that's kind of how I'd mostly prefer them as just fillers within Asteria Ruiz. I'd play him uh, against pretty much every lefty in baseball. And since he's going to get at least one AB against the lefty, I'm fine there playing him at the, at the top of the lineup. Jonah Bride, he might be in the three hole. He's like 2,000. Decent, cheap third base plays, third base play there. Um, so little offense here from Oakland for me. Probably not a ton because it's Oakland. Uh, and on the other side, Paul Blackburn, I, I do want to play him. 7,000, I think he's, I think there's value we could squeeze out of this price tag, and I'm fine with 30% ownership here. This is a good matchup. Plate discipline for Blackburn is fantastic outside of just the lack of pure swinging strikes. Just doesn't have the raw strikeout stuff generally that we want to target, but this is Kansas City, and they'll strike out against, you know, you or me. They've been far, far better recently. They've gotten their strikeout rate in aggregate this season under 23%. They've been much, much better. As we've seen the WRC Plus for them continue to tick up. But Paul Blackburn, um, you know, his stuff is actually pretty damn good. He's got six pitches here. He doesn't walk people really, and it's certainly at the same rate uh, as last season. He's gotten the barrel rate totally under control here. That's not a problem anymore at all. 62, 63% strike one with 30% chase. He's still got uh, a lot to keep him in play and keep him very competitive here. Um, you know, it doesn't give up hard contact. So I think this is fine. He'll give up some batting average. That's where I'm kind of worried. He's giving up, you know, an aggregate, roughly a 290 batting average, running about four ticks cold there. So could see some positive regression in that respect. Running a little bit cold into Woba as well with a 340 uh, realized roughly about 4% cold with a, a 305 X Woba here also. And same thing with the ISO, running a bit cold to the tune of about 2%. So I think you can see some positive regression, and this is certainly a matchup where we'd like to target that with Paul Blackburn. No problems really with anything. Um, he's absolutely the guy I'm going to be playing here. Like certainly in cash, you just click in Blackburn and, and don't think twice. In tournaments, maybe do the lack of a uh, you know pure strikeout rate here. You could go elsewhere. But uh, I think he's got 25-point upside as well in tournaments, so I've got no problems doing that. Okay, let's finish off here with a quick review. St. Louis and Pittsburgh offense only here for me. Maybe a Drew Rom if you find that he's got like a changeup or something because he's 4,000. Not sure you're really going to need to get all the way down there, though, today. Um, some playable guys here that could make some decent constructions happen for you. No Bailey Falter, just some, some Pittsburgh and some St. Louis. Um, favorite plays from St. Louis going to be Contreras, definitely. Arenado and Goldschmidt. Not so much Jordan Walker, because Falter still stays down in the strike zone from a batted ball perspective. From Pittsburgh, you know, uh, Brian Hayes, Kutch, Connor Joe in the middle, definitely the favorites there. Mets Atlanta, um, very little pitching here, maybe a little bit of Allen Wine, and it's mostly just offense. If you can make full Brave stacks happen, yeah, go ahead. Uh, there are some cheap guys down here with Blackburn and, I don't know, maybe like an Ashcraft or something. You could make an Atlanta stack happen. That's not totally uh, unquestionable. Um, Mets a little bit too against Wine as he's still young arm. I have got no problem going after that. Seattle and the White Sox, maybe a little bit of Seattle in full stacks because Tukey walks everyone. Uh, so no Tukey for me. Uh, he does suppress contact and production, but he just puts too many people on base. Um, Luis Castillo, definitely. You want to go after the White Sox here. I think it's a pretty okay matchup. Um, and the left-handers here, not really all that scared of. Maybe a Luis Robert from the right side or an Andrew Benintendi would be the best place. Boston and Houston, I want to get to offense pretty much exclusively here. Uh, I think it's a really sneaky tournament game and one that could very much win slates for you here tonight. Both of these guys very much attackable in the opposite end of the platoon. Um, and even from Javier's perspective, in the same end of the platoon. So I like Boston a good bit here, even though Houston uh, has the best contact figures split adjusted. Since he in L.A., I think since he is in play in tournament stuff, probably yeah, maybe in 20 max. They're a good 20 max stack generally. 
because you're going to get a lot of leverage off of Lucas Giolito. I've got no problem playing some Giolito, but I want to be careful with you know 40% ownership um, just because he's cheap and in an okay matchup. This is still a very dangerous spot uh, against Cincinnati. It's their price tags that's really going to keep me off of excess exposures, but getting a little bit here for leverage purposes I think is perfectly warranted. I don't really want to play much of it of uh, the Angels. Give me a little bit of Ashcraft. I think he has to be in play construction-wise and fundamentally a little bit too. Um, Texas, Arizona, offense only here for me, I think. Maybe a little bit of Jordan Montgomery, but very, very little. No Slade. And give me game stacks if I can make it happen, but offense pretty much exclusively. Miami and San Diego, uh, mostly just San Diego here from Waka and an offensive perspective. Um, you know, a token Jazz Chisholm or whatever against any righty in baseball is fine. And some Luis Arise from a contact perspective, he's down to 4,500. That's playable now. Uh, you could make this happen. Jake Berger, I do like at 4,000 from a same handed platoon perspective. And Georgie Soler, of course. Um, you, know, you could find a Miami stack, but it's not a favorite of mine necessarily. And you got to just keep an eye out for who Miami is going to throw. If it's Cueto, I like the Padres a good bit in, in tournaments. Uh, if it's Weathers, maybe not so much. Casey in Oakland, no Davidson or Alec Marsh or whoever the hell it's going to be. Good bit of Blackburn. I think you can squeeze a value out of uh, the fundamentals, the price tag, the ownership, pretty much all of it here for Blackburn. And maybe a little bit of Oakland, too as filler pieces because they are cheap. Uh, okay, that's it. We're done here. Projections and ownership are loaded to the site and to SaverSim as always. So good luck and keep an eye out for updates as we'll push them all throughout the day.